Hi friends, if you're new here, welcome. This video is going to be a discussion that I had with V, also known as Snappy Dragon. She is a historical costumer, she does video essays, historical, political things, historical myth busting. You should definitely go subscribe to her if you have not already. I will link her channel over here and also all of her socials will be in the description box below if you would like to check them out. I hope you enjoy. So we both, as people know, are some of the most uh, political <laughs> people. In At least loudly political. Yeah, some of the, the more loudly political historical mm -hmm. costumers. I always found history class to be kind of boring when it was just this king and this date and it was just mm -hmm. memorizing stuff. But I love learning about history through things mm -hmm. like clothing that were really had a lot of cultural significance and also just like affected people's everyday lives. It puts you in people's shoes. It makes you empathize with them and identify with them and understand them in yeah. a way that the sort of broad strokes of a history class and talking about like, oh, this king whose life you could probably never relate to because they're king. What interests me is the the meaning and the context and what the pretty dresses signify. What do they tell you about a person? How much work was put into them? It's not just like the history of the aesthetics or the history of a particular style. It's the history of what it, that dress tells you about a world. Yeah. And there's so much there. And I think when people just look at, oh, well, this was the style of dress in this period and just focus on the aesthetics, the, you miss all of that. We did a video recently over on my channel about um, the sort of problematic context of modern historical costumers calling back to the visual mar marketing of the suffragettes, like their protest symbolism, the white dresses, the striped sashes, and why all of that was chosen. And why modern costumers calling back to that is not great, because a lot of that imagery is both directly and indirectly tied to a lot of racism. Yeah. and. What I've seen happen, they'll see somebody say this particular historical outfit is a problem for this reason, or it's inappropriate in this particular setting, or like maybe don't wear 1860s clothes for fun at a plantation. And they'll be like, oh my goodness, historical dress is awful and I should never wear it and it's all inherently bad. And it's like, no, but it's about that specific setting. It's yeah. about that specific context. You don't really get an easy way out in that situation. You have to actually do the the study and the understanding and get the knowledge of what is actually going on with the dress you're wearing. And that's that's not as easy as just being like, everything is awful, I'm not going to touch it. Yeah. But if you're like, everything is awful, I'm not going to touch it, one, you're not going to learn from anything. And two, if you want everything to be perfectly ethically pure before you have anything to do it, you're going to need to get a sheep farm and you're going to need to start growing and weaving your own wool, even modern clothing. There is so much exploitation in the labor practices and how the raw materials are grown and how it gets shipped around the world and marketed and everything that you're not going to be able to get away from that either. So yeah, it almost feels like people yeah are just trying to escape it when they hear, you know, like, 1860s is bad. Yeah. Uh, but exploitive labor practices have been going on this entire time. They mm -hmm. never stopped, at, they not in changed. the last few hundred years. Yeah, they've just changed. And your modern clothes, your historical clothes... Yeah. What I'm getting at is, like, I just want people to do activism and stop worrying about if their clothes are racist or not. Escape is not the solution. <laughs> yeah. You're never going to be able to escape far enough. You're never going to be able to... Like, none of us have ever lived in a world that is free of prejudice. It's not something you can get out of or get away from. And yeah. thinking that you can is honestly kind of a really privileged uh, attitude. And, and also people thinking that a specific costume in a specific setting, or even just a specific costume, having a bad context is the entire thing, and not wanting to bring that back to the way that they live their life outside of what clothes they're wearing mm -hmm. and what they do. The thing to learn about the racism tied to the suffragette outfits is not, oh, don't wear a suffragette outfit and stop there. It's, oh, think about what this signifies in the modern women's rights movement. What are, like, the problems that we're still having? And especially in historical costuming, like, there's a lot of... A lot of white supremacy, a lot of people who mm -hmm. are doing it for reasons... For, for specifically white supremacist reasons. Because they want the good old days back. Yeah, that. People also talk about uh, how 
clothing is more disposable now. Mm-hmm. And I saw someone on TikTok bring this up who actually was completely unrelated to historical costuming, but talking about how people treat their clothing as disposable even when mm-hmm. it isn't actually made poorly just because it was made by exploited labor and they bought it for not a lot of money they think now they can treat it like it's disposable Mm -hmm. versus and i mean you can but should you yeah the thing about making your own clothing though that i think we both found and a lot of people find is that you're a lot more inclined to want to take care of it and want to mend it and want to treat it like it should be treated rather than just like yeah. it's disposable. The other thing about making your own clothes is that you get to make them actually fit. I have, I think everybody has the struggle of standardized sizing, making it difficult. And it doesn't matter what body type you have or um, like I've never met a person, even somebody with a, a body type that society idealizes, who has an easy time finding clothes that fit them really well. Yeah, I feel like it's gotta be, like, less than 1% of the population that's close enough to standard Mm -hmm. fit models that they actually, like, just wear clothes and they fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. Some of the way modern clothes are constructed is specifically because of that. I mean, I think that's part of why we have, like, the really low arm size is because, well, if you have a higher arm size, it needs to fit you really well. Part of the reason why our clothes tend to be so deconstructed, so few layers, so little tailoring, so little structure compared to historical clothes is because, well, to have that structure, it's got to fit you really well or it's going to be a disaster. Whereas a loose, stretchy t-shirt, you can put that on more body types. I think it goes along with modern, like, body ideals and people's view of it. Mm -hmm. Like, the whole idea of clothing being a set size, Mm -hmm. like, no one thought that was the thing until yeah. 150 years ago. So the other nice thing about making your own clothes is that you notice like there's always these trends that show up in what's available in stores. There was a while where I was looking for a particular style of like lounge dress and I just couldn't find it because that's not what was considered fashionable at the moment. And if you're making your own clothes, well, it's like, who cares what's currently in fashion? You make what you want. Yeah. Um, I did eventually manage to find those dresses through thrifting. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have found that you get something and you really like it, and then two, three, five years later, you try to go back and find it again. And, and it's just not there There's because none. the trends have changed. Yeah. So if you're making your own stuff, it doesn't matter quite as much. They talk about this a little bit in like more traditional men's style, which has a lot of red flags in it, so I mm-hmm. reference it sparingly. Uh, but how it's it's really nice to have your own like core sense of style that isn't reliant on the season and the trend Mm -hmm. because it can kind of just feel like being pushed around and like Mm -hmm. you don't have your own sense of yeah visual identity and especially now when we have these like body type trends where it's like what are you gonna do like go get a fifty thousand dollar plastic surgery so you can be trendy yeah and and we don't have the layers within our clothes that allow you to just adjust your clothes to the fashionable shape rather than having to change your body so like i mean i'm in full turn of the century dress right now and I look like a literal hourglass and like yeah I have a bit of an hourglass figure but I've also got bust padding hip padding two petticoats and a ruffled corset cover on under this I am not anywhere near this shape but it doesn't matter because the clothes allow you to to make the clothes the fashionable shape rather than having needing your body to be the fashionable shape So somebody in my comments was telling me on a previous video where I made all of these Edwardian structural underpinnings about um, the structural underpinnings that are used for traditional kimono. And like, you pad your figure for that too, you just do it the opposite way. So like the Edwardian silhouette, you're trying to make yourself an hourglass. Um, This commenter was telling me that for traditional kimono, you pad yourself until you're literally a cylinder. So you'll wrap like towels around your waist and all sorts of stuff like that. So it's not just Western Europe. So what are you wearing? I'm wearing a combination of things. This 18th century petticoat that you just lent me. (laughs) I like this pairing because Mm -hmm. the skirt is an 18th century European skirt, but it is similar to the Tang Dynasty pleated skirt that would actually be worn with this. Mm -hmm. Um, These are approximately, this is 18th century, this is approximately like 9th century China. Mm -hmm. And then underneath, I have like a sort of history bounding um, Mm -hmm. middle layer of like vaguely the first millennium of Chinese (laughs) clothing. It's really 
there isn't that much surviving, and a lot of the paintings like don't mm-hmm. show the underlayers, so people just kind of guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is pretty similar to like what is accepted as the middle layer of clothing, so a layer that would not be quite against the skin, but in some settings would be like a could be the outer layer if you're at mm-hmm. home if it's casual. Yeah. But if you're going out, it would be under other clothing. You see- I love mixing uh, the different cultures, different size of my heritage. Mm-hmm. Being biracial, there's always this kind of these two cultural identities that are, they're both there and maybe you don't quite feel fully one or the other, Mm -hmm. which for me sometimes means that if I'm dressing up in historical clothing from only one place, it feels a little bit more costumey because Mm -hmm. it feels like it's not, like I, I don't quite feel like I'm dressing up as my ancestors sometimes because it's only one set of your ancestors. Yeah, so I really like mixing things because Mm -hmm. it feels more authentically me to have these different elements from different cultures versus having everything Mm -hmm. be the same. And also, like, I just realized you're wearing all linen, so I mean, you're not (laughs) wearing any chatness. I am wearing all linen. What are you wearing? You've already talked about it a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm wearing full Edwardian shtick. I think the thing for me, and what I end up doing so much is... As as an Ashkenazi Jew, as a white Ashkenazi Jew, there's almost this tension of feeling like your heritage becomes invisible, especially in the modern world, where unless somebody looks closely, unless you tell them, they're not necessarily going to know that that's what your background is. Or they'll assume that, oh, that's what your background is, but really you're just American, right? It doesn't matter. It's just religion. And it's not. Historically, when people see you in historical dress also, people tend to just forget that, yeah, um, either there were Jews around or there was a reason there weren't Jews around and that reason was usually genocide. So you almost feel like invisible in who you are because you're in historical dress and people are just gonna assume that, well, you're just white. So I try to always make sure that if I'm making historical clothes, there is something Jewish about them. And there are times when that's very visually distinct Um, like certain cultural styles, um, certain forms of identifying dress that I've made part of costumes, because were those things traumatic? Yes, it feels more powerful for me to wear it and make sure people remember than to choose not to wear it because it was something traumatic that was imposed on my people. But also, even in like little situations where it's not particularly visible, I won't put wool and linen in the same item of clothing. It doesn't matter what that item of clothing is, I won't do it, because that's prohibited in Jewish practice. And is that visually obvious? No. But during the process of making the garment, it makes me feel like I'm putting more of myself into it. I love that. I think that's the beauty of making your own clothes and Mm -hmm. being able to put things into the process that maybe... You know, if someone was doing it as fast Mm -hmm. as they could, for as cheaply as they could, they wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But because it's for you and it's because you can put Mm -hmm. whatever you want into it and actually have significance to the way it's constructed. How do you feel just wearing the clothing that you've made around people in public or by yourself? Just like, like what is different about the experience of wearing clothing that you've made versus wearing something off the rack? I mean, it fits me a lot better. That's for one thing. Like... I I don't have a particularly easy body type to fit because of just my proportions, I guess. So nothing ever fits me off the rack. And there's also a lot more utility to it. There have been days where if I have bad back pain, I'll put on like full 19th century or turn of the century clothes so I can wear a corset that will give me back support that I don't get out of modern clothes. Like today, I've been having this awful flare-up recently, and I'm wearing a corset, and it's taken enough strain off my muscles that I'm not hurting a whole lot just sitting here. I think in public, what's really fun is the sort of reactions that people tend to have when they see you wearing something interesting out in the world, like it's no big deal. There was a time when I I was having one of those really bad back pain days and I was wearing like full 1890s, hair up, big wool walking skirt, corset, blouse, hat, everything. And I was going to the farmer's market with a friend. We stop and pick up these Girl Scout cookies and I'm not paying a ton of attention because I'm paying for the Girl Scout cookies. And my friend is just like watching a couple of these Girl Scouts behind. And these Girl Scouts were apparently, my friend told me, just sitting behind the table with like the starry eyes and the mouth like, 
having this realization that like you can just dress like that. That's what I love about making clothing rather than costumes so much. Mm -hmm. I don't make costumes much partly because I feel bad about having things that I put tons of effort into that I can't wear because they're mm -hmm. too costumey. Um, although I do it sometimes because it's fun, but mm -hmm. I love I love just wearing clothing as clothing mm -hmm. because there's like this unspoken social construct that in normal places you're gonna look normal, and when you just show up at a random boba shop wearing clothing from 500 years ago, <laughs> it's fun. People enjoy it, and it sometimes people just. It like it makes their day. I, mean, I love like, the the mental picture of like okay, let me roll into a boba shop and just get boba in clothing from five hundred years ago. I mean, it's fun. Sometimes I think people are confused, and yeah, it's like they're so not used to seeing mm -hmm. something that is, and especially when you go really hard and do the full thing. Yeah, they're just like. Well, Where did you come from? Like, did you come out of a movie? Are you a time traveler? What's well, going on? And you get, like, I guess different sets of reactions when you're full-on, like, absolutely nothing resembling modern dress. But there's also a certain amount of, like, fun to combining things. So, like, I wear t-shirts with 19th century walking skirts a lot. It kind of puts you in the middle of, like, okay, well, in some respects, you look very 21st century, but there's, like, this thing that is not lining up. And it still works because it still gives people that sense of, like, oh... These, these rules we have about how you're supposed to dress, they're malleable. They're socially constructed. You can change them if you want. I have these, like, 19th century uh, vest and skirt sets that I'll, like, wear over t-shirts to holidays or, like, going out places. Um, actually, hand me those. I made matching yarmulkes to go with a couple of my 19th century outfits like out of the same fabric so I can wear them for like Hanukkah parties or going to synagogue or seders and it's just really fun to have these little matching like such unique bits of relatively modern cultural clothing because I guess the sense of like women wearing yarmulkes is relatively modern. I think a lot of people hear the, the phrase no costumes without context and they think that it's going to be only about bad things, awful historical events, and there is a lot of that, but it can also be something that's really empowering and and a celebration. Yeah, it, it really does feel like a celebration and a validation, and like, I'm gonna be honest, like, when I first started doing any form of Jewish historical costuming, I felt like really disconnected from my identity, and now I feel much closer to it, and like, I have ways of engaging with it that actually work for me. Rather than feeling like, oh, I'm not a particularly religious person at heart, so there's not really any way for me to connect with this. But through through clothing, through studying history, through understanding that context, I feel like I'm able to be closer to my identity and like I'm able to celebrate it. And it is very positive. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely felt like that. I love I love using clothing, making clothing and wearing clothing as a way to to feel empowered about the way that you just exist in space. Mm -hmm. And the, I mean, that's true with modern clothes too. It's why yeah. people have such an interest in fashion, even when it's not historical, is it's such a powerful tool of self-expression. Yeah. No matter what it's from. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I will drop these links in the card over here and in the description box. Also, both V and I made dresses using the Robin blouse pattern, which you can purchase. Uh, I will also put the link for that in the description and I'll put the card for the video tutorial uh, over here. We took the sleeves off or just didn't add the sleeves and cut it off at the waist and added a circle skirt and made these adorable, super comfy mid-century dresses. Go buy my pattern. Shameless plug for me and my patterns. That's about it. And I will see you next time. Bye. Don't mind me, we'll just crash into a rosebush. <laughs>